Well, good morning. Welcome to Greenfield this morning. Glad that you're here. We got lots of people. So glad that you uh, were able to finally see some better weather coming. But I uh, we want to welcome those who are joining us online as well. Um, I'm going to invite you to stand with us for a call to worship, and then we're going to transition into some, some worship. And our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 89, verses 1 to 2 and 5 to 9, and it says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Will you join us this morning? to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ, I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free, I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is death's defeat. to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe. of heaven he's preparing a place for me far beyond what hearts imagine eyes have heard or eyes have seen i believe that the day is coming he's returning to claim his bride light the altar keep it burning see the lamb who rose up i 
hello to the people around you. What if we could reduce the number of children entering the foster care system by 70%? That's the vision of Safe Families for Children, a nationwide network of volunteers providing childcare and community to parents in crisis. While there are situations that require the state to separate parents from their children, the vast majority of individuals caught up in the foster care system are great parents who love their kids. They are just simply under-resourced when it comes to relationships. Many do not have any positive, healthy, constructive relationships in their life, and because of that, they are unable to be the parents that they really want to be. Addressing social isolation allows safe families to reunite kids with their parents nearly 95% of the time, and they're hoping to grow to over a million volunteers in the next three years by mobilizing our volunteers to provide emotional and relational support to the parents and surround these families in crisis, we really do believe that we can keep thousands of children out of the foster care system. Good morning. So that was a video from Safe Families, uh, and that was an American promo, but it is an organization that exists in Canada as well. And so Safe Families is an organization that Greenfield, we've been kind of talking to them for about four years now. We had an info night plan in the works for April 2020, and then we all know what happened in April 2020, and um, that just didn't happen. And so we've, through the years, have been talking with um, Brittany Santos, uh, came in as a representative from Safe Families and kind of shared one Sunday morning with us kind of about what the work they do and how, as Christians, we care for one another. And so this we finally have that info night kind of ready to go. So I just want to invite you all this Wednesday to a Safe Families. It's like a dessert and information night where we will gather and they have representatives coming and we will learn more about the work they do and how they interact and how they're trying to build those volunteers within the Edmonton context. Um, just some, some more information about who they are. So as the video shared, they're an organization that works at reducing the number of children that enter foster care. Um, so once essentially a child enters foster care, it's really hard for them to kind of leave. And so Safe Families is this middle space where they are helping support and resource families um, for a temporary period of time uh, to work at reunification then later. And so the neat thing about Safe Families, how it works, especially within the church context, is that there's such a variety of roles within a church that um, congregations and community members can participate in. So yes, real, from a very practical standpoint, they have foster families within their program that will take on uh, children that need help. But on top of that, they also do a very good job of resourcing churches to gather and then have people who support foster families within their community as well. So if you can't foster children, but you can support by providing diapers or food for a family that does foster children, um, they do a very good job at kind of like the wraparound coverage of resources for, for those people. So I'm excited for this Wednesday and I hope you come out and just learn more about Safe Families and the work they do at Edmonton and um, our opportunity to partner with them. That's 7 p.m. this Wednesday and there'll be dessert. Downstairs. Thanks, Chris. So a couple other announcements. Uh, one, this Saturday, there's also the Paint Night fundraiser uh, for Father's House International. Uh, and so this is at 7 o'clock here, and you can come, and it's to support this uh, orphanage in Romania. And so if you have any questions about that, Elaine Broussard uh, is on the board and can answer any questions you have. Um, also, over the, we just came, you know, from the Easter weekend, which was, uh, an amazing weekend with Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday. Uh, there were a couple 
uh, individuals connected with our community of faith who uh, passed away over that weekend. So uh, Werner Schmidt, uh, who was a longtime member here, uh, he went to be with the Lord early in the morning on Good Friday. And his celebration of life will be here at Greenfield uh, on this Friday, coming up at 1.30. And so you're welcome uh, to, to join us to remember Werner's uh, life and to celebrate his faith. Uh, there also, it will be live streamed uh, if you're unable to join in person. Um, in addition, Monica Gutowski, who is a longtime member here, her father, Bruner Dreyer, passed away on Easter Monday. And so with this one, there's a visitation that's happening Wednesday night at the Serenity Funeral Services on 91st Street. Um, and the graveside service, which everyone is invited to as well, uh, will be at Glenwood Memorial Gardens on Thursday at 2. Bo both of these uh, things are noted in the e-bulletin. So just wanted to, to note that. Um, now, it's the first Sunday of the month, and so first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion. Uh, we have Soup Sunday together. And I also just want to mention our benevolent fund. This is a fund that is used uh, to help people with sort of sudden needs uh, within our community or connected in some way to our community. And so if you would like to give to the Benevolent Fund, you can just mark Benevolent uh, on the offering envelope or in the note section uh, when you give by e-transfer or however you may give. Um, in addition, we do have a refugee fund that we are partnering with Dayspring Presbyterian, just down by no frills, uh, to sponsor a family who is almost here. Right? So the, the Suman family has been approved, and in the next few months, now it's always, who knows, with government how long it will take, but we sort of committed to $12,000 towards the sponsorship of this family. Currently, our uh, total is around 7500 And so, again, if you want to give towards this refugee uh, resettlement project, you can note that uh, in your, with your offering, uh, that you want the money to go to that, just say, re, you know, right in their uh, refugee resettlement. So those are just some sort of housekeeping announcements. Now, um, I'm pleased to announce, and this has been in the bulletin for a couple weeks, that Ronel Drapiza will be joining our team as a part-time pastor of worship, starting officially tomorrow, though seeing that for most of us it's a day off, really it's going to be Tuesday. But on the piece of paper, it says tomorrow. Um, Ronell and his wife, Anna, have been coming to Greenfield for about eight months. He has a certificate in, in uh, worship music from Vanguard, a BA from the King's University. He also just started working on an MA in spiritual care and chaplaincy from Providence Seminary uh, in Manitoba. And he's a gifted musician. You would have, when I bring him up here, you'll know who it is because you would have seen him. Uh, he's a gifted musician. He also produces music. Uh, and so he does all things music, which I do none things music. Um, and what really stood out, I, I just want to say, to the search committee uh, was his, his godly character um, and his authenticity, right? And so he's just a, a good quality guy. Um, and so now with Ronell starting, that means that Kirsten Leitz will be transitioning out of her interim role uh, as our worship team's coordinator. And so she has faithfully served in this role for the last 18 months. And it has been a joy to serve alongside her. Uh, she uh, is a talented musician, uh, a ta talented flautist, um, and, uh, and she, what she, her plans are that she will be upgrading her uh, schooling with the goal of doing a graduate degree in counseling and, and maybe doing some music therapy, something like that. So she's not sure. But um, I would like to call them both up, Ronell, uh, Kirsten, and want to pray for them. Um, I, I, was, I was thinking that we should have, you know, Kirsten run down one aisle with the baton and then, you know, hand it off to Ronell and run out, but they didn't want to do that for some reason. Um, so, but come a little closer here. So I just want to, again, thank you so much for all your service. And, and by the way, Kirsten and, and Ethan, they're planning on continuing staying at Greenfield and all that and worshiping with us. Um, and 
being on the worship team and all that. So yes, let's, you know, I, I missed it. You guys were quick, so that's good. Uh, so yeah, just being great and look forward to working uh, with you more. So let's pray together. And so Lord, we just thank you so much for Kirsten. We thank you for the gifts that you have given her, her and, and how she has worked to hone them uh, and her uh, musical talents and even just her organizational gifts, Lord, that she has been uh, a truly a pleasure to, to work alongside these last 18 months. And so, Lord, I pray that as she uh, goes back to school, that you would be with her, that you would bless her, that you would clarify even and just give direction exactly what she uh, what you're calling her to. And so, Lord, I thank you for her, and we do really appreciate her. Um, and for Ronell, we just pray for him as he uh, begins this new role, that you would be with him, that you would just use him in, in our congregation, in our community of faith here, to uh, lead us in worship, to encourage us, uh, and to, to be with the, the music teams that, as he comes alongside to, to pastor and to care for uh, and to support them. And Lord, as he comes on the staff team, Lord, I just pray that, uh, that, that we would appreciate his gifts and talents and who he is as well. And so, Lord, we just thank you for how you've provided uh, in, in both of these uh, cases you know, for our community. And Lord, so we uh, just commit both to you and we thank you so much for uh, who you have created them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we invite you to continue to stand with us as we uh, continue in our worship.
thirsty. Come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to sing come Lord Jesus come we sing come Lord Jesus come all who are thirsty Tyler, as he comes this morning, we pray that you will fill him this morning with your word. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. And our kids, as they're transitioning out to Sunday school, we've got grades that are age two to six, and they're heading out right now. There's also a nursery available.
Our scripture reading today is found in Revelation chapter 22, verses 6 to 21. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of the scroll, because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magical arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Thank you, Kirsten. So uh, we are at the end of our study of Revelation. It is done. Now, I say that because this is our 20th sermon uh, on the book of Revelation. We started in the fall, and we have kind of taken some breaks for Advent and, and the New Year. But it's, it's been, uh, uh, I've enjoyed it. It's been long, though. It's been a lot of work, I, I will confess, because Revelation is not an easy book. And so uh, when, I, when I say, when I read, it is done, there's a little bit of relief in that. Um, but of course, this, this verse, or this phrase, it is done, uh, is actually from chapter 21, verse 6, where... Um, where Jesus says, it is done, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring spring of the water of life. And so here, of course, in the context of the book of Revelation, it's just this, after this amazing vision of the new heavens and new earth, of the new Jerusalem, that now, when all of this is completed, then Jesus says, it is done. And it reminds me of Jesus' last words on the cross, right? When he, when he said, it is finished. And that there's this sense, there's, as we come to the end of the book of Revelation, we, we come to this sense of closure, this sense of that, that now, you know, we're, we're, we're finished. The revelation, uh, these visions have been reported faithfully, and now we're done. And in this last bit of this chapter, um, even as you listen to it, uh, there's a lot of miscellaneous things that are kind of, you know, all the things are wrapped up at the end. 
And so this morning what I want to do is, is I want to do three things. Okay, first I want to go back and do one thing that I just didn't have time to talk about last week or the week before, um, and I, but I do feel I want to say something about it. So there's a little bit of unfinished business where I want to explore the significance of, of verse 5 in chapter 22. Um, and then I want to take a look at and highlight some points from this ending of the book of Revelation from 6 to 21 and just highlight some of the main themes there. And then I want to come full circle back to our guiding thesis. So when we started this uh, in the fall, um, I, I sort of had a, you know, I, I, I shared with all of us what my guiding thesis was. And I just want to come back to that today and to remind us, and I guess to keep the main thing the main thing, right? With the book of Revelation, there has been so much speculation, so much uh, interest in various aspects of it that have kind of distracted from the main message, I think. And so I just want to come back to that. Uh, and then, of course, that'll lead into the Lord's Supper uh, this morning. So as far as some unfinished business, uh, last week I commented how often we're more preoccupied about thinking about, well, what are we going to do in heaven? You know, do I have to sing? Like, what if you don't like to sing? Right? Or what if you can't sing? You know, do, are, do you just sit there and mouth the words like you do in church every Sunday? Um, you know, or, or like, are you going to, are we just going to be praying all the time? And well, you know, I don't know. Should we, you know, you, not everyone, prayer isn't necessarily for everyone. So now last week I emphasized that while, you know, the focus of, the ending of the book of Revelation is rather than an event, rather than sort of an itinerary of heaven and what time breakfast is and all this, I emphasize that really that what we see with John's vision of the end is that we see a person, right? And, and we focused on the presence of God that we, when, when, when Christ returns and we have the new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem, that, that we will see God face to face, that they will see his face. And, and so I don't want to take away from any of that, that that is so true, that is so profound, that, that we will be reunited, that the, uh, the results of the fall, all of that will be healed. And we will be reunited and reconciled with God. And that we will dwell in his presence. And that's something that should blow us away. Like, like last week service, I feel like I have a little bit of an Easter hangover. Uh, today, because like last Friday was, I thought was a very meaningful uh, Good Friday service as we sort of took the path to the cross following Jesus. And then last Sunday, I thought like the baptisms, if you haven't watched, if you weren't here, um, I would really encourage you to go on the live stream and, and, and hear uh, uh, Lola's testimony, Stephen's testimony, and the baptisms, and the choir. It was a beautiful service. And, and so it was, I think, uh, it, it was a... F Easter should be the high point of our year as, as Christ followers, and as we gather together, as we worship. And I, and I do feel that, that, that our time together last Sunday did capture some of what I think it should be. And, and so, so while... I don't want us to forget that main point, that it's the, the reconciliation with God, that it's the presence that we get to enjoy, the presence of God face to face. Um, there is something to be said for, well, what will heaven be like, the new heavens and new earth? What will we do? And, and one of the things that I, I think that you see in the book of Revelation and throughout the rest of the New Testament is that there's a restoration of humanity in the image of God, and that we will do what we are always meant to do, right, and reign with him. And so this is something you get right at, at the last verse that we read last weekend, in, in verse 5, that, and they will reign forever and ever. Earlier in 5.10 in the book, it says, you have made them, persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, to be a kingdom and priests, to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. 
And so you have this idea that is woven through the book of Revelation, this idea that, that humanity, we will reign with God, that we will fulfill our God-given uh, calling as image bearers. And, and so that doesn't mean that we're, you know, like, so what exactly that looks like, I'm not sure. But this idea that humanity, you know, when we were originally created, Right? In, in the book of Genesis, it talks about how we were created in God's image. And we were placed here to represent God and to lovingly rule over the earth. And you see that reflected in, in, the, in Genesis 1, but also in Genesis 2, that we're to tend the garden. Um, and then and you have Psalm 8 and other places where it also highlights that, that, that God has created humanity you know, for a purpose. You know, to worship him, but also to be productive, to be involved in caring for this planet. And I don't know if that's going to end just because we're on a new heavens and new earth. Um, of course, the fall brought frustration to this uh, and, 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 and exploitation. And, and really, a lot of, you know, that we were called to be good stewards of this, this planet and instead, we've tended to rule like Babylon and uh, sort of follow more Babylon-like practices rather than following the lamb and taking care of the earth. But that's, that's a matter for another day. But, you know, our relationship with the earth right now is kind of twisted. And our, our, our how we live out the image of God is something that, you know, is being renewed daily in us. But that is something that we are called to. And you see this, this idea in other places in the New Testament, um, you know, in Ephesians, Colossians. I think some, 2 Timothy here is pretty clear where it says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, with Jesus, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So throughout this New Testament, there's these hints, this idea that, that humanity was created with this royal role as image bearers and that we will reign with God. And you see this come up again in Revelation's picture of, of, the, of the new heavens and new earth at the end. And so in John's vision, the resurrected followers of the Lamb have their original role as image bearers restored, and that we will reign forever and ever on the new heaven and new earth. This again is something that's fascinating. Now, one of the questions is, well, who will we rule over? Because when we think of reigning and ruling, well, it has to be over someone, right? Who do we get to boss around, right? And that's because our, our view of ruling and reigning has been twisted, right? We always think of power as power over people, you know, the ability to tell people what we, you know, what they ought to do. But what I think is fascinating with this picture that we get in the book of Revelation, and, and here I would say that Richard Bauckham, again, a book that I just find is very profound in his theology of the book of Revelation, and I would have quoted and referred to him a number of times over this series. He highlights, he says, the point is not that they will reign over anyone. The point is that God's rule over them is for them a participation in his rule, that we will reign with Christ, that we will, that relationship that was broken in the fall will be restored, and that, that we, will ha we will come to our, our, our created for, you know, what we were made for will be restored, and we will reign with Christ. So I, I, I sort of wanted to just you know, put a bow tie on all of that, because that's one thing that we just didn't get covered uh, in the past. Now, when we come to this passage in verses 6 to 21, there are a number of things here, and I just want to highlight some. Um, and, and really, there's a number of things that are said in this, these last few verses that have something to do with the message that is just followed, right, from the rest of the book of Revelation. And so now he's summing it up and he's bringing a few things together. And one of the first things that he says about this message is that it's trustworthy, right? The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, we read in verse 6. Uh, and so here we have this idea that this vision, the, 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 what John has seen and what he has written down, that it is something that's trustworthy, 
Um, and, and it goes on and it says, uh, you know, here, the reason why it's trustworthy, in verse 6 anyways, it's trustworthy because it ultimately comes from God. The God who inspired the prophets. And, and here this is sort of one of the things where John is sort of including himself in there. Like we talked at the very beginning of the book of Revelation that this is, is an apocalypse, right? It's a, it's a unique piece of literature from the first century that's kind of weird. It's an apocalypse, but it's also a letter. But then it's also a prophecy that, that John was bringing God's word in their day, in their way, to the people. He was bringing the message that they needed to hear at that time. And, and so over the last 20 weeks, we've kind of overheard uh, or listened in on that message to then see, well, how is it applicable to us? But one of the things that, that John wanted to assure us is that, that this message is trustworthy because it has its origins in God. Uh, and then also John himself says in verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. Right? So he's, he's kind of appealing to his own veracity, his own uh, trustworthiness, that he heard these visions and saw these visions, and then they were recorded. And so he wants to, you know, uh, not only are these from God, but he has produced them trustfully. Um, and this is something like in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, you, you see this with John as well, where, where he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And while John is referring you know, to his letter that he's written to some of these other churches, I think the same can be said for the book of Revelation that John stands behind this vision, this apocalypse, this book. Uh, and then if we, if we don't think that that's enough reason, uh, we have a third piece of evidence of the trustworthiness of this message comes from Jesus himself. Right? Where in, in verse 16 of this chapter, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. That Jesus here also uh, is the trustworthy, uh, the one who gave this message to the churches. Uh, he is the root and offspring of David, right? Which is these messianic images that we have. And he is the bright morning star, which that's one, it's a little bit more, uh, not sure exactly what it's referring to, but you know, I, I think that it's highlighting that, this, that a new age has dawned in Jesus' first coming and then also when he comes again. So these words are trustworthy and true. Is one, one point that John wanted us to take away. The second thing he says, he, he has this statement in verse 10. Do not seal up the words of this prophecy of the scroll because a time is near. Uh, and here, again, it has to do with the message. That don't, uh, don't seal up this message and forget about it. And this here is an allusion to Daniel chapter 8, where that's exactly what the, Daniel was told. Right? Daniel was told uh, in verse, chapter 8, verse 26, uh, the vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given to you, to Daniel, is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. So here Daniel, you know, back in Old Testament times, he was told to seal up his prophecy because it has to do uh, you know, with the distant future. And, and here you have this direct illusion where now uh, it's saying that, well, no, you don't seal up this message, be, and John is told not to, because its message needs to be heard. Right? The focus of this message has been, like when you think of it, going back to chapter 5, right, is, well, who is worthy to open, the, to unseal the scroll? And it's Jesus who was, un, who was worthy because of his... Uh, sacrificial death on the cross. And, and so here John is you know, being told, don't seal it up. It's being unsealed. We need to hear this message. We need to... Uh, and, and when you're thinking in the first century, that for the Christ followers, for the followers of the Lamb, 
who were living under Roman rule and that oppressive regime, that they needed to hear this message because, you know, at its very essence, this message was to give them hope, was to help them persevere, was to help them to continue to follow Jesus faithfully in their day and age. And in light of what the followers of the Lamb were currently experiencing at the hands of the empire, that they needed to hear this message that despite all appearances, that God is in control, that God is on the throne, that the Lamb is on the throne, and that he will one day, when he returns, that all things will be brought together in Christ, and it will truly be done. And so he, he talks about this message that it needs to be, that it needs to be shared. It needs to be read in the churches. It needs to be something that should encourage people. Not to speculation, but to faithfulness. And finally, it does talk about that there's some warnings and blessings in this section. Uh, First, there's a warning. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will also add to that person the plagues described in that scroll. Which if you weren't here for those signs, that's not a good thing. Okay? And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. That's a pretty dire warning. right? And again, it highlights the importance of this message. Now, when you talk about uh, you know, th- this apocalyptic literature, uh, this is something which commonly is found in this type of literature, these warnings not to change anything, right? Because a message is so important. Now, one thing that uh, sometimes this verse is used to refer to you know, the, the canon of Scripture, Right, to the whole Bible. And, and of course, Revelation in our Bibles is at the very end. And so this is seen a lot of times to say, well, you know, don't add anything to the Bible or don't take anything away from it. Well, maybe it has that significance. Maybe we can interpret it in that way, but that's not, first and foremost, what this is referring to. Uh, it's very clear in the context and, and, and just the reality of the fact that uh, when this was written, they did not have Bibles like we have Bibles, right? That they had, each book would have been on different scrolls. Uh, And even when talking about the scroll, it's referring to the message that was given to John. And so here, uh, it's saying, what John is saying at the end here, is that this message that he has seen and heard and what he has written down, don't change. And again, this highlights the importance of this message, that you don't want to, to seal it up or forget about it because it's important. And also, uh, because this scroll, this vision, it's, it's a revealing of Jesus Christ, right? And it's his message, it's from Christ himself, that they are to be heard and heeded. So again, John is emphasizing the importance of, of keeping the message found in the scroll. And that relates to the blessings that you find uh, at the end as well. Um, there's seven blessings throughout the book of Revelation, right? Seven sort of beatitudes. Uh, and two of them are found in this last part of chapter 22. In verse 7, it says, Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Uh, and then in the other one in this chapter is from verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Now this is, I think, a beautiful bookend to the book of Revelation as a whole because in chapter 1, right at the very beginning, you also have a blessing where it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Um, And I think that's significant too because it's talking about the, the... the reading aloud of the book. And one thing that we've tried to do throughout the sermon series is to read the words of the book of Revelation uh, consistently. Now, sometimes when we were doing big chunks, we didn't read it all. Um, But blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, 
for the time is near. And so what does it mean to keep the words of this prophecy? You know, it doesn't say speculate on the words of this prophecy and draw up some nifty figures and charts. Now, I I think that in, in some of the sermons, I did have some pretty nifty charts. Okay, and you can go back and look at them. Um, but I think the point is that throughout that the book of Revelation is, is, again, back to this main message of one of perseverance. As Christ followers living in uh, the Roman Empire, that they were, forced, they were faced daily with these constant pressures to accommodate you know, to the world around them. They were persecuted. And, and part of it was to emphasize that they are to be faithful that their allegiance is first and foremost to Jesus alone. Now, our context is different, right? We don't have, uh, well, depending on what you think of, what you think of Trudeau and all that, we don't have an oppress- oppressive regime over us. We are in a democracy, um, and we, are in a, we can participate, we can vote. So our context is different. But so what does it mean in our context, in our day and age, to keep what is written in it? And I think, too, that while our temptations, while our situation is different, we still face temptations to accommodate to this world in various ways. We still face, uh, you know, subtle, I, I hate to say persecution. Now, for us, this maybe isn't something that we face. But in other parts of the world, that if you were a Christ follower in Nigeria or in other places, that they do face overt persecution. And so I think from a global level, we need to keep that in mind. We have it pretty easy, real, real in in Canada. Um, But to realize that there's some brothers and sisters in Christ who are keeping the, the message and persevering in the faith is something that is costly. But I believe in our context, while it may be more subtle, it's something which also can be costly. It might cost you advancement in your career, right? It might cost you relationships. You know, there is this, but the point is that we are to keep what is written in it. That Jesus has to be kept, first and foremost, as the top of our allegiances. That above and beyond anything else, we have to keep Jesus first. And that's something which I think in any day and age is a challenge. So when we started this series, this was my guiding thesis. That the book of Revelation at its very core is a book about Jesus Christ, worship and discipleship, and final hope for the world. And I think as we went through this book over this last year, that this still rings true. That it's a book about Jesus Christ. Um, and we can say so much about Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain, right? That, that, the, that the one who is worthy because of the cross, and that he reigns, Uh, today and he will come back and he will reign in the future as Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings. We see that he's trustworthy. We see that in this passage at the end, right, that that he is trustworthy. We saw that all throughout the book of Revelation, you know, from the very beginning to the end, that Jesus is uh, the, the true and faithful one. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that he is God. One of the curious things, uh, now, I don't want to, you can talk to Randall if you want to have a history of Trinitarian, the development of the idea of the Trinity, Um, but one of the things that I think we've saw and that I tried to point out again and again in the book of Revelation is how Jesus, uh, that the same things are said about God are said about Jesus, that that John has a very high Christology Right, that he has a very high view of Jesus, that, that Jesus wasn't just 
a good teacher, that he wasn't just a popular rabbi, but he was God. And you see this even in this passage uh, in, in verses 12 uh, to, to 13, where it talks, where Jesus himself says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, which echo God's words in chapter 1 and verse 8, where God says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come. And, and I could multiply example and example throughout this book, right? Where God, you know, we see the one who's seated on the throne in chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, that, that lamb that was slain is also at the center on the throne. And so throughout all of these visions, we have seen how God, our understanding of God has been expanded to understand that it's God and the Lamb, that it's God the Father and Jesus. And of course, the Holy Spirit we see throughout the book as well, but not as prominent, not as in your face, I think. But here Jesus Christ is clearly seen as God and understood as God, um, as part of the, the triune God that we worship. The other thing that we hear three times, just in these last verses and other places throughout, is this idea that he is coming soon, that Jesus is coming soon. Now, in the first century, it seems that that universally in the New Testament, that they anticipated that Jesus was was coming soon, hopefully in their lifetime. That's why Paul had to uh, do some you know, correction or some further teaching in Thessalonians because some people, some, some of the first generation of Christ followers had passed away. And, and they were wondering, well, what's going to happen with them now? You know, Jesus hasn't returned yet. And now the book of Revelation is written probably later than uh, many of the other books in the New Testament, but there still was this anticipation. And I think part of it is that, that Jesus is coming soon, which really means that Jesus will come suddenly, that we won't No, and we have to always be prepared. And so we see this anticipation, this, and and it's tied into hope, right? That in the first century, under Roman rule, that you can understand why they would want Jesus to return. And we see that today as we struggle and as we continue to struggle in in different ways. we, We look forward to when Christ will return, that when everything will be wrapped up and brought to consummation in the new heavens and new earth. That the coming one, you know, will bring fulfillment to all what God, all of God's purposes for creation. Now with worship and discipleship here, I think it's, it's interesting that throughout the book of Revelation, we've seen these depictions of worship that have been awe-inspiring. Right? We've seen the, the living, four living creatures and the angels around the throne and the multitudes worshiping and praising God. But we also find three places where worship is something that's commanded. And we have these two interesting episodes near the end of the book in chapter 19 and then in this chapter, in chapter 22, where John, obviously overcome by the, the, his visions and all that, he falls down at the feet of of what turns out to be an angel, and he he offers worship, and the angel says, what are you doing? Don't worship me. Worship God. Right? And so even John, caught up in the midst of these visions, that whatever experiences he was having, he, you know, he, he confuses where our worship should truly be directed to. And so you have this, you know, imperative that we are called to worship God. And I think that's something that we need to always keep in mind, that, you know, there's many things that we're tempted to worship. Right, again, it's talking about allegiance. What is first and foremost most important in our lives? Right, is it money? Well, if money is your highest priority, then, you know, you're probably, probably worshiping money. If it's education, if it's family, right, which is a good thing, but if family is first and foremost then you're probably worshiping family. Right? There's many things that we'll worship, but, but John, in the book of Revelation, always wants to point us back that our worship 
should be directed only at the one who is truly worthy. That's God. In chapter 14, verse 7, it says, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. Don't worship the creation, but worship the Creator. Now, as far as discipleship, you know, throughout this book, we've seen these calls to, to follow Jesus faithfully, to persevere in our faith, to keep on keeping on. And I think that's something that we see. Now, in this last section, there's just one, um, there's one statement in verse 14, which John says, Blessed are those who wash their robes. And here, of course, the illusion, this, the symbolism here is who wash their robes with the blood of Jesus. Right, that the blessed are the ones who follow faithfully and rely on Jesus' sacrifice that we may be holy, that we may persevere in following Jesus, that we may persevere in holiness, that we may persevere in, in, in loving others. And with all of that, we need the constant transformation and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But we are called to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And that's something which you see throughout the book of Revelation. And then finally, we talked about hope for the world. This is hope despite all appearances, right? That, that with the book of Revelation, John was peeling back the, or opening the curtains, peeling back the veil, um, and to get a sense of what's really happening in this world in this unseen world. And you see that you know, God is truly working in this world. That he's working to you know, call people to repentance, to call people to himself, that the Holy Spirit is, is going ahead of us in this world. And that, you know, that, that should give us hope. Someone mentioned, I was in a conversation, I can't remember, I'm old, um, someone was talking about a sermon they heard about never give up praying for someone that was preached here before I was pastor. Um, and I think this is kind of what this, this emphasis is, that, you know, when I think of, you know, some people in my family or some people that I've prayed for, you know, I, I have to admit I've kind of given up praying for some of them. But I don't know, can God really work in their lives? Like, I know he can. I've seen how he's worked in my own life and in other people's lives. But this perseverance is something that we just need to keep going, despite appearances. We need to keep praying and, be, and persevere in our prayers. And keep being faithful, even when it's tough. You know, uh, Nietzsche... And then Eugene Peterson took it and made it more popular for Christians anyways. You know, he talks about, you know, he, uh, Eugene Peterson had the, the I, I love this title of his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That that is what the Christian life is. We're, we're here for the long game. And, and it's tough because the little decisions that we make every day matter. Not just the big decisions, but this, this long obedience in the same direction. Because as we're going, and you sort of, if, if your goal is way out there, and you veer off just a little bit, you know that you'll be way out of, you know, way out of range when you, when you get there, right? I'm trying to make an allusion to ship sailing or something like that. Um, but we need to keep this hope. And one thing that you see throughout the book of Revelation is that it's based on the firm conviction that God will accomplish his purposes in and through his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That the book of Revelation is about Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. It, it tells us about his character, about who he is, but it also tells us that he is coming again and that we need to 
persevere with hope. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We don't often talk about, you know, or, or have the same hope. We, you know, I want to, do I want Jesus to come back right away? Well, I wouldn't mind seeing my kids get married, you know, and have some grandkids. And I get all that, right? That, you know, and, and their Brad is holding his, you know, beautiful granddaughter there. And, and, I, and I, you know, but, but this anticipation, this hope, that we have, that Jesus is coming, that when you think of like what that will be like, it'll blow away any other sort of expectations or hopes that we may have. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, that every month when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we read these words that we will remember Christ's death on our behalf until he comes. Right? It's embedded in the, the last bit of you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. But when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we, we remember the bread, you know, the body of Jesus that was given for us. You know, by the cup, we remember his blood that was shed for us. But it's always in this sense, it's not just a remembrance of what happened in the past, but it's also this meal that we share together with anticipation of the future when Christ will return. That it's until he comes, till he comes again. And in the meantime, as we remember together Christ's sacrifice for us, the lamb that was slain, that we are to follow the lamb faithfully. And so this is also a reminder for us to keep on keeping on. right? A reminder for us that Jesus is, uh, should be first and foremost where our allegiance lies. That everything else pales in comparison. And so as we uh, celebrate communion this morning, as you take the bread and the cup, when you, when you go back to your seats, so we'll, we'll queue up in either aisle, and you can come and receive the elements. And when you go back to your seat, reflect on well, what truly is most important in your life. And if it's not Jesus, then you probably need to make that right. And so I encourage you to spend time in reflection and in prayer as you're holding the bread and the cup. And then after we are done, that we'll, we'll eat of it together. There's gluten-free at all the stations, and if you have any sort of mobility issues, catch my attention. I kind of know where you are, um, but in case, in case I forget you, just, you know, yellow Tyler, and I'll come and serve you um, where you are seated. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. You know, the blood that was shed on the cross that we remembered last Friday, on Good Friday, that that blood is the, covenant, the new covenant in Christ's blood. That makes this relationship, reconciliation possible. So this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I ask Randall will come up and give thanks for the bread and the cup. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, 2,000 years ago, your son on the cross declared those words, it is done, it is finished, to tell us die. 
the debt is paid in full. In the act of his faithful life and faithful death on the cross, he offered us a way, a path to restoration to you. And on that Easter Sunday, that resurrection life came into this world, the down payment on the future resurrection to which we all look forward. Now as we gather together, we remember that death and that resurrection. It is done. There is a way, a path through the shadow of darkness and into new life. We partake of it together, Lord. We also look forward to anticipation of that life coming in its fullness as your kingdom is established once and for all time in that glorious future when again you say it is done. We now live between that D-Day and that V-Day. We live on Easter Saturday, often in the brokenness of this life. And as we do so, we do so as a prophetic witness in anticipation of your coming kingdom and recognition of the kingdom that even now has come. We pray that your Holy Spirit would dwell with us now as we partake of this communion elements together. One body, faithful to you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance. Let's remember together. Will you stand with us as we close in worship?
Chili. The guys made chili today. I made a pot of chili. I think it's edible. Um, but please join us uh, for uh, lunch downstairs for soup Sunday, for chili Sunday. Um, and you can vote for your favorite chili. We're not going to do a you know, official thing, but you can sort of, if you like the one that you had or if you try a different, couple different types, feel free to vote for them and someone, you'll make someone feel good at the end of the, at the end of lunch. Or, or bad, I guess, but, you know, yeah, okay. Well, there'll be 10 people that feel, ah, oh, not that good, but one person will feel real good, so that's good. But um, I, I just pray that, like, that, that song that we were singing, that, you know, that that is our prayer. Right, that we would that we would know Jesus, that Jesus would be first and foremost in our life, that He would be our uh, that our allegiance would be to Him alone. And so, Lord, let's let's pray together. So, Lord, we thank you so much for your great love for us that we celebrated last weekend, but we celebrate this morning with communion, and we should celebrate every day. Lord, at how generous you have been to us and how loving you are that you sent your only son to die on the cross so that we may have life, that we may be reunited, that we may be transformed into the image of your son until that day then when we will see and experience you face to face. Lord, and until then, we pray that may you come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with God's blessing. If you would like prayer, you can come up to the front and someone would be more than happy to pray for or with you. God bless. And Lord, we thank you for the food.